Riley Sy here. Today I want to talk about the periodic table. You know, that weirdly shaped table that chemists use. All the examples I'm going to use come from the website ptable.com, which is a great interactive periodic table that I use in my classroom. They're not paying me or anything for it, it's just a good website. First of all, you'll notice that it's made out of a grid of boxes, and the grid is a strange shape. Well, let's talk about the boxes. Each element is represented by an element box. Let's look at the element gold. It's in shiny. There's the name gold, the number in the upper left, is the atomic number. Remember, that's the number of protons in the nucleus and also the total number of electrons. That lower number, that can't be the number of neutrons. How can you have 0.97 of a neutron? That's because that number isn't the number of neutrons, it's the atomic mass of the element. But isn't the mass the number of protons plus the number of neutrons? Yes. But this number is an average mass. Remember, some atoms of an element, like gold here, will have more or fewer neutrons than other atoms of gold. These are the isotopes of gold. This number is average mass of gold atoms. Usually there's one isotope that is much more common than others, and the mass number reflects that. So the mass number, 196.97, minus the number of protons, 79, is 117.97. Rounding it tells you that the most common isotope of gold has 118 neutrons. The AU is the symbol for the element. You see, this table is used all over the world by scientists who speak other languages. A Spanish scientist would have a table that didn't say gold, it would say oro. But it would still have the same symbol, AU. Gold's symbol is based on the Latin name, Aurum. And that explains the element box. But what about that column of numbers? Okay, okay, you got me. Most versions of the periodic table don't show this set of numbers, but ptable.com does. If you add up the numbers, the sum is the same as the number of protons. I mentioned earlier that electrons appear in energy levels, or shells. The list of numbers shows how many electrons are at each energy level. The first has 2, the next 8, then 18, 32, 18 again, and finally 1. That last one, the one, is how many electrons are in the outermost electron shell. This is called the valence shell, and the electrons in it are surprisingly called valence electrons. Gold only has one. The outermost electrons, the valence electrons, are the most important to chemistry, because those are the ones that are involved in chemical bonds. The other electrons pretty much just sit there, but the valence electrons can interact with other atoms. As you go across the periodic table, the atomic number increases by one for each box. When you start a new row, it's one more than the last element of the previous row. So going across, then going down, row by row, each element has one more proton than the 
and the preceding element. Okay, that's it for the element box, for real this time. Okay, periodic table of the elements. What does periodic mean? Well, periodic essentially means that it repeats. You use a table that repeats periodically, the calendar. A year is made of 12 months. Each month has four to five weeks in it. It's typically made with the days going from Sunday to Saturday. The weeks appear over and over and over again periodically. If you have a Monday, then seven days later it's Monday again, over and over. The periodic table also repeats periodically, starting a new row at column one and working its way across. It's laid out in convenient rows and columns. The rows are also called periods, and the columns are called groups or families. The first row only has two boxes in it, hydrogen and helium, so there are two elements in the first period. Looking at the columns, the elements in a group, in a column, have very similar properties. Again, chemistry all happens with the electrons of atoms, specifically the electrons in the outermost energy level, the valence electrons. All the elements in the same column have the same number of valence electrons, so the elements behave similarly. I'm not going to get into the weirdness of the main group of metals here, but I want you to pay attention to the first two columns and the last six. Here's a diagram for the first element, hydrogen. It has one valence electron, so it's in the first column or group. And here's the second element, helium. There are two valence electrons. Now, that energy level, slash electron shell, can only hold two electrons, so it's full. All the elements with full valence electrons are in the last column. Here's the next element, lithium. It has three electrons, and the third starts a new electron shell. This is the outermost shell, so it's the valence shell, and it only has one valence electron. Each row adds an energy level, so the elements in the first group all have one valence electron. Now, in middle school, you will probably be dealing the most with these first and last blocks of the table these elements. That's because they're the most predictable. The shells get filled in in order from shell 1, the innermost, to shell 7, the outermost. In between is the main block of metals and the two rows at the bottom. For quantum mechanical reasons, the electrons start filling in middle shells after starting the valence shell. It's difficult to understand why, so for simplicity in middle school we usually don't work too much with them. Speaking of those two rows at the bottom, why are they separate? Well, they're only shown separately from the rest of the table for convenience. They really belong between columns two and three, and this is what it looks like with them in the right place. You can see that it's so wide and the boxes are so small that you can't show much information in the boxes. That's why they're broken out and shown separately at the bottom. Most of the elements, the ones in color here, are metals. In their solid form, they're fairly hard are shiny, malleable, and conduct heat and electricity pretty well. This 
large block called the transition metals are the ones we normally think of as metal. Iron, copper, silver, gold, titanium, and so on are in here. On the other hand, the elements in the upper right are the non-metals. They're kind of like the opposite of metals. As solids, they're soft, dull-looking, brittle, and don't conduct heat or electricity well. In between, there's this diagonal line of elements. They're called the metalloids. They're not quite metals and not quite non-metals. They're somewhere in between. Finally, I want to highlight a couple of the columns. On the far right are the noble gases. These have filled in their valence shell, so they're very non-reactive. They don't want to form chemical bonds with anything else, even themselves. In contrast, the first column, the alkali metals, have one valence electron. They're very reactive. They would love to get rid of it. Doing that would mean that their new valence shell, the next one in, is full, so they become very non-reactive. Similarly, the column right next to the noble gases, the halogens, just need one more electron to fill up their valence shell. So these are also very reactive until they've done so. Again, the valence shell, the outermost energy level that has electrons in it, is very important in how an element behaves. The valence electrons are the most important ones in chemistry. Now, as for the weird shape, each of the large chunks of elements has the electrons filling in the shells in a certain overall pattern. This is because of quantum mechanics, which is just slightly above middle school, so don't worry too much about it. The reasons make sense, but only if you really get into how atoms fill in their various energy levels. Whew. That was a lot, and I didn't even get into the history of the periodic table. I hope this was helpful and interesting. Riley Syatt.